Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth presentation of the year. I'm uh, Brent Taylor, the convener of the Speaker Program for Military History and Heritage of Victoria. On behalf of our committee, I welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. Tonight, we're pleased to have Mike Carlton presenting Scrap Iron, Iron Flotilla, and my voice doesn't come anywhere near his. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a radio voice, Mike, and it's well practiced. <laughs> It's a bit crazy um, at the moment. Yeah. Um, now a little, bit, a little bit about Mike. In a working life of more than 50 years, Mike's become one of Australia's best known media figures. He's been a radio and television news and current affairs reporter, foreign correspondent, radio host and newspaper columnist. He was an ABC war correspondent in Vietnam in 1967 and 1970, and for three years was the ABC's bureau chief in Jakarta. He also reported from the ABC from London, New York, and major Asian capitals. In television, he was one of the original reporters on the ABC's groundbreaking This Day Tonight in the 1970s. He also worked for Nine Networks News, a current affair, and a current affair. In 1980, Mike, Mike started a distinguished career on talk radio with a top rating breakfast program on Sydney's 2GB and then in London at News Talk, where he won a coveted Sony Radio Academy Award for Britain's best talk breakfast show. His radio satire on current affairs, Friday News Review, was the most listened in Australia and the UK. In television, he reported and hosted Indonesia, a report, reporter returns a three part documentary for SBS and he worked on Radio 2UE as a broadcaster for many years and wrote long-standing column for the Sydney Morning Herald. And that's quite a life. So um, before Mike begins, we'll just talk a little bit about process. He'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and we'll do this in two ways for those that know. You, if you're feeling shy, you can post a chat message at any time up to and including question time and address it to everyone. When the time comes, I'll read your question using your first name, or you can wait and put your hand up during question time, and I'll invite you to ask your question verbally. Um, Mike's happy for the screens to be on, but remember everyone can see you. Please make sure your microphones are switched off, otherwise everyone can hear you. By now, you should be on speaker view, and I now invite Mike to speak. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um... Florid introduction. <laughs> it is a, a great pleasure to join you this evening by this miracle of internet technology, which I do not pretend to understand, but which somehow seems to work, I hope. Uh, I'm still recovering from the dreaded COVID, actually. Fortunately, a very mild version, but I've got a, a, a cold, so I'm, I may go a bit funny on you. I'll do my best. The, uh, the Scrap Iron Flotilla is uh, my fourth book of naval history. Uh, it's a subject, naval history, a passion I've had since I first read Nicholas Montserrat's novel, The Cruel Sea. His uh, brilliant story, brilliant novel of the, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic, which I read under the bed covers by Torchlight, because my mother thought it was unsuitable. That, and, and very much later, Patrick O'Brien, his uh, epic novels of Captain Jack Aubrey and the, uh, the Age of Fighting Sail in the early 19th century, are uh, truly magnificent, a work of genius, in fact, that uh, inspired me all the way. The difficulty with this book was it began just when COVID hit and, and lockdown happened to us all, both here and uh, in the UK, uh, which meant I could not go and talk to people, could not visit the files of, say, the Australian War Memorial in Canberra or the UK Public Records Office at, uh, at Kew in London, which I would have done normally. So it all had to be done online. But the records there are plentiful if you know where to look. And after four books, I pretty much know where to look. Uh, Australian, British, German and Italian. They are there online in profusion and often the German and Italian stuff has been translated. So it's, uh, it's good stuff. Uh, in Australia alone, the War Memorial, the National Library, the National Archives, the, uh, the RAN Power Centre and the Navy Historical Centre here in Sydney uh, do wonderful stuff in their various ways. And I don't know if you've ever encountered Trove, T-R-O-V-E, which is the newspaper records of, uh, of Australian newspapers since the start of the colony in 1788, start of uh, Sydney. Uh, and they're all online up to about 1975. And there are an awful lot of newspapers and every little small town had a newspaper, often a daily, sometimes just a Sunday paper. 
but they're there and you can search it and it's easy and it is astonishing the stuff you can turn up you'll find your grandfather's cricket cricketing store scores your, your mother's your great grandmother's wedding it's, it's all there and it's very very well worthwhile they're running short of money but they're a brilliant brilliant national treasure anyway that was part of it and then more deep trawling turned up um Diaries, books, letters, memoirs, uh, which relatives, descendants of scrap iron sailors were very kind in, in uh, allowing me to, uh, to use, to give me the run of it. So um, away we went. When, uh, when Britain declared war on Germany on Sunday, the, uh, the 3rd of September, 1939, it was uh, entirely inevitable that Australia would be there. Australians then, they were, we were very different people. They saw themselves as distinctively Australian, proudly Australian, yes, they were. But they could talk of themselves as part of the British race, uh, as they called it. Loyal to King George VI, the sovereign monarch of the, uh, the greatest empire the, the world had known. And so at 9.15 on that Sunday evening, Prime Minister Mr Menzies, as he then was, broadcast on the ABC that uh, in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that as a result, Australia is also at war. As a result, there we were. So, as a result, at 9:50 p.m., the British Admiralty's war telegram arrived at the Navy office in Melbourne. Uh, the order to go to all-out war. It was just two words, very punchy, succinct: total Germany. And that was repeated to Australian ships, wherever they might be, followed a short time later by another signal, slightly more discursive, commence hostilities at once with Germany. On that uh, weekend, the Navy was as ready as it could be. It had been prudently preparing itself for war for, uh, for months, if not years, bringing ships out of mothballs and back into commission, refitting others, among them five elderly destroyers, ancient is probably another word for it, of uh, first war vintage, Stuart, Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager, and Waterhen. They were being hurriedly supplied, manned, repaired, and commissioned, ready for sea. The Navy had just 430 officers and 5,110 men, more than either the Army or the, or the RAAF, believe it or not, and hundreds more trained reservists were being hurriedly called up. Now, it was nominally the independent sea service of an independent nation, a dominion. But the RN, in fact, operated as a branch office, a subsidiary of, uh, of the British Royal Navy. Uh, its ships and weapons were British, and those ships flew the Royal Navy white ensign uh, at the stern. Uniforms and ranks and rates were identical, although the Australians were better paid, quite a bit better, both officers and sailors. But training, tactics, doctrine, customs, traditions, even the sailor's slang were the same. And the RAN was commanded by two uh, Royal Navy admirals who did the job with one eye on the Admiralty at Whitehall in London and the other on the Australian Naval Board in Melbourne. Unthinkable today, but then it was no bad thing. In fact, it was smoothly successful. There was little or no friction, no great disagreement between them and us. The, uh, the RN was still the best and biggest, as it had been for centuries. Every Australian officer had spent some time in a British ship, starting uh, as a midshipman and going up, and many had done RN specialist courses, signals, gunnery, torpedo navigation, etc. Some had even commanded a British ship, like um, Commander Hector MacDonald Laws Waller, who had a destroyer, HMS Brazen, during the Spanish Civil War, and we'll hear more of Waller down the track. But the happy result of all this was that when the war broke out, the RAN had a corps of superbly trained Australian officers up to commander and captain's rank, and senior sailors too, petty officers and leading seamen, all of whom knew their jobs and set about doing them. It was very smooth. The question though was where to do them. The war was far away in the Northern Hemisphere. At first, uh, Australian ships were at sea patrolling shipping lanes off Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Fremantle, more for something to do than anything else. The uh, destroyer steward under Heg Waller fought a, a mighty anti-submarine battle off Terrigal, just north of Sydney. Uh, depth charges a lot with what eventually turned out to be an underwater rock shelf, known forever afterwards as the, uh, the Battle of Terrigal. But it was not long before the British requested help and they were given it. By Christmas 1939, those five Australian destroyers, Stuart, Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager, Waterhem, 
had passed through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, where they joined the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet, then based on Malta. In fact, they pretty well were the Mediterranean fleet. The British had withdrawn most of their ships from the Battle of the Atlantic. We were filling the holes, making up the gaps. By today's standards, they were, they were small ships. Stuart, uh, a destroyer leader, just a little bigger than the other four, but not quite 1,500 tonnes full load. Crew of around 140 men, top speed at best about 34 knots, although their engines raised at worn and 30 knots was probably more like it. That's still a good speed though, even by today's standards. Ships haven't got much faster, they're bigger, not much faster. The crews uh, were joked, they were held together by rubber bands and fencing wire. It was said that here and there you could actually spin the rivets in the hull plating with your fingers, and apparently you could. And by modern standards, they were quite appallingly primitive and uncomfortable. They swarmed with rats and cockroaches. The, the sailors' messes, where they both ate and slept, there was no sort of cafeteria messing as there is today. You, you ate where you slept. They were overcrowded and stinking with stale air and body odours and, uh, and God knows what else you would get with men packed in together, cheek by jowl. The food was mostly bloody awful. Uh, with very little refrigeration, fresh food ran out very quickly after a few days at sea and they lived off uh, tin stuff. And with these ships designed during the First World War by the British, never famous at any stage for their sense of hygiene, uh, there were no showers or baths on board. To wash yourself or your clothes, you got a, a bucket of cold water, ran it under a steam pipe to heat it, and then sloshed it over yourself cheek by jowl with another dozen men who'd be doing the same thing. It was a tough life, but then this was a, a tough generation. You know, they'd, they'd grown up as children of the depression, knowing what it was to have a, a mother struggling to put a meal on the table, uh, a father out of work. They did not ask for much and they didn't get much. They gave a lot. When these five uh, arrived in the Mediterranean, the, uh, the Nazi propaganda minister, that nasty little poison dwarf, Joseph Goebbels, sneered at them as, as a consignment of junk, unquote, a load of scrap iron. And the Australians, when they got to here, they took a rather perverse pride in that, in that sort of strange Australian way we have, all right then, and they, and they adopted the name. And that name now is, is history. The Mediterranean in 1939, the, uh, the Middle Sea, as it was known to antiquity, was something of a backwater in the war. It was an important theatre, no doubt about that. For the British, it was the gateway to India and the empire. And it was vital to Australia's interests too that the Suez Canal be kept open. Britain and Australia depended heavily on Middle East oil and we exported you know, wool and wheat and so on. But the real naval war was raging in the Atlantic and the North Sea with the rising menace of, of German U-boats attacking British supply convoys. Uh, in the Med, for all of Mussolini's bragging and bullying, Italy was uh, at least nominally neutral. Uh, the French and the British were dominant. Uh, in October 1939, the Germans did attempt to run a couple of U-boats, three U-boats, uh, into the Mediterranean past Gibraltar, but for one reason or another, uh, they failed and they pretty much gave up. The enemy at first for the Australians was the weather. It was, uh, it was winter. Said to have been the worst winter in, uh, in local memory. If they went there with visions of, uh, of you know, Mediterranean beaches and palm fringed shores and so on, they were to be bitterly disappointed. Stuart's first job in the week before Christmas was to sail from Malta to pick up a, a troop convoy in, in Marseille in France. It was foul and filthy, cold and raining. A, a heavy sea met them as they cleared Grand Harbour and it grew relentlessly worse as they headed northwest towards France. The ship labouring against a strong icy headwind and Walls of green water breaking over the bow and crashing aft as high as B gun, the second gun, with the thunderous explosions. The captain, Heck Waller, slowed the ship to eight knots, barely enough to keep steerage way. And still she pitched and rolled, creaking and groaning, plunging into a deep trough one minute and then heaving up to the next towering, terrifying peak. In the wheelhouse, the quartermaster struggled to keep a course. Bill Reeve, an engine room artificer from Hobart, just 19 years old, would write long after the war that these were the roughest seas he ever encountered. The intonometer on Stuart, he said, uh, was graduated from naught to 50 degrees on either side. 
and it was hitting the stops. That's a 50 degree roll. The guardrails were eight to 10 feet underwater when rolling and the mess decks were always awash. At times it was impossible to keep the galley fire alight, so we had cold meals. It was quite a contrast to the Red Sea two weeks earlier. Below decks, uh, it was utter misery. The forced air heating failed. The decks were slimy with water, sloshing this way and that. And the air was heavy with the stink of seasickness. I had not expected this in the Met, as I said, tourist post divisions of calm blue seas and sunny beaches were a long way away. And the weather would dog them all the time in the Mediterranean. Sometimes, of course, it, it was glorious. Calm blue seas, clear skies, gold and crimson sunsets, the, the Mediterranean picture postcard. But then out of nowhere, from, uh, from Europe, uh, freezing winds, driving rain, mountainous seas. Or the Kamsen could blow up. The Kamsen, a vicious choking dust storm out of the North African desert. So thick, that the watch on the bridge could barely breathe, could barely see beyond the forecastle with dust and grit. So invasive, it would find its way through the fans that sucked air into the engine room. And as I said, the living conditions on board were primitive. After a few days at sea, they were living on tinned food and potatoes. It was misery, but they took this life stoically as a matter of course, the way things were. The Navy wasn't a bad bargain for them in many ways. From their depression upbringing, they, they got regular pay, seven shillings a day for an able seaman with a little extra if he had wife and kids. And these destroyer men were allowed another six months a day as compensation for the tough conditions, hard lying money it was called. So harsh though the Navy life could be for a lot of men, it was a good bargain, a deliverance from the uncertainties of civilian life. Everything changed that northern summer, 1940. Mussolini, like a, a jackal of a carcass, declared war on Britain and France on the 10th of June. 12 days later, France fell and the balance of power swung sharply. The British Mediterranean fleet was now on its own and significantly outnumbered and outgunned by the Italian Navy, the Regia Marina. But it was not our admiral. The RN's Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean and Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham was a feisty Scot, bold and creative with a keen strategic brain. And with the, uh, the French out of the war and effectively neutralised, a sad and sorry saga that was, from his new headquarters at the port of Alexandria in Egypt, he set about taking the war to the Italians. A former destroyer officer himself, he'd actually commanded a destroyer at Gallipoli in 1915. He knew and liked Australians, <coughs> pardon me. And over time, he set up a fine rapport with the five destroyer captains from down under and with Captain John Collins, CEO of the cruiser Sydney, which had nearly arrived as well. So although the book, my book is chiefly about those five scrap iron destroyers, it became quickly apparent as I was writing it that other Australian ships there in the Mediterranean would just have to find their way and the story would be incomplete without them. So John Collins and, uh, and the crews of Sydney drew first blood for the RAN on June 28, 1940, in a battle south of Greece with three Italian destroyers, sinking one of them, the Espero, described by one of Sydney's officers, uh, Lieutenant Jack Ross. We approached slowly from astern, noting that she was still flying her colours. And as we came up, she opened fire again, several shells falling uncomfortably close. Captain Collins now had no option but to re-engage at what to us was point blank range and practically every shell found its mark, blasting great pieces out of the destroyer and demolishing what little remained of her superstructure. Nothing daunted by the hopelessness of her position, she continued to fire on us with a little 4.7s game to the last for as long as they could be fired. To us gathered on deck to see the end, she was a horrible flaming mass, belching great clouds of black smoke and listing at an acute angle as her battered hull slowly filled with water. We watched her in silence, somewhat awed and dismayed, I think, at the terrible sight of our handiwork. And then with the last crackle of flames and a hissing of steam, she lurched over onto her beam ends and slid from sight. as Lieutenant Jack Ross. Collins rescued as many survivors as he could, and then with striking humanity, he left one of his boats, a cutter with food and water, in the hope that others might find it, and they did. Collins never learned this, he never found out, but 14 days later, starving and nearly dead, six survivors were rescued from that boat 
by an Italian submarine, they made it home. The destroyers, meanwhile, were, were flat out. The uh, consignment of junk was escorting convoys of supplies and men here and there and everywhere, supplies as precious as gold, precious more than diamonds. Fuel particularly, sustaining Malta, sustaining the fleet, hunting the occasional submarine, battling the occasional breakdown which afflicted their ancient engines. Sometimes they would join the, the main fleet to bombard the, uh, the Italians on shore in North Africa. Sometimes they would be fighting off uh, Italian air attacks, which frightening though they could be, were largely ineffectual. The Italians bombed from a very high altitude at first, although they came down low as the months went on, but still from about 10,000 feet. And Australian captains developed a very fine judgment as to when and where the bombs would drop and with skillful helm and engine orders, they would send their ships twisting and turning and, and healing out of danger. It was uh, almost an art form and it, it had to be. The ship's anti-aircraft defences were, uh, were pitifully weak, inadequate, designed to fight off uh, plodding old string, uh, you know, string and wire biplanes of the First World War. The main armament, the four inch guns, didn't have the elevation and the machine guns and pom-poms didn't have the range. Things uh, improved later when they managed to get hold of Italian uh, Breda guns captured in North Africa, a far superior weapon which they bolted to every available horizontal surface. There's a great story of, of Hank Waller, Captain of Stewart, lying flat on the deck under Italian bombing. The bombs are coming down there, port and starboard and shrapnel going over and filthy splashes of water. He's lying on the deck, uh, next to a young able seaman, or young ordinary seaman, as they called him in those days, who just joined the ship, kid of about 19 or 20. And while I told this story later, trying to, uh, to raise morale with the kid, he said, um, ah, he says, not too bad, son, is it? And the young sailor looked at him and he said, it's not too fucking good either, sir. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lovely story. And it gives you a glimpse of what Waller was as a man and a captain. The destroyers were much better equipped for submarine hunting with ASIC, what we now call sonar, able to probe below the surface and depth charges to make the cure. That was a painstaking business, hunting the target hour after hour, back and forth, but patience often paid off. Uh, in late June, Voyager joined some RN destroyers in at the kill of two Italian submarines, the first for the RAN, but it cut both ways. On the 11th of July, Vampire was straddled by Italian bombs, which showered her with splinters, hold her lightly below the waterline, but killed her commissioned gunner, John Endicott, a Royal Navy officer, just 33 years old, and who thus became the first man to die in combat in an Australian warship uh, in this war. Married with a young daughter, I think. The cruiser Sydney struck the next Australian blow too in a, a stirring encounter with two Italian cruisers in uh, a battle which would make John Collins's name as a resourceful, creative tactician and, and fighting captain. On July 19, Sydney and the RN destroyer HMS Havoc had orders to provide distance cover for four other British destroyers on patrol, east to west and down around the island of Crete. And if nothing happened, uh, Collins was then to head north to the Gulf of Athens. Something uh, did happen. Two Italian cruisers, the uh, Giovanni de la Bandanere and the Bartolomeo Colleoni, and I practice those pronunciations, jumped these four patrolling British destroyers off Cape Sparta, just to the northwest of the, uh, the Greek island of Crete. Heavily outgunned, the British destroyers ran north towards Collins, who, in turn, hearing their reporting signals, headed south towards them at full speed. And here was his genius. If he'd obeyed the strict letter of his orders, he would have been as much as 300 kilometres away. But he had strategic brain, and on a hunch that trouble might happen, he'd stayed much closer that previous night, much further to the south. And in the morning, when it all blew up, he was just 60 kilometres away. Keeping uh, radio silence so as not to give himself away, uh, he sent his ship's company to breakfast and stormed towards the Italians. A risky business. He didn't know what they were. Uh, Eight-inch cruisers with bigger eight-inch guns could have stood off and pounded into pieces at their leisure with longer range and greater speed. Luckily, as it turned out, they were six-inch cruisers uh, and not in the mood for a fight. 
the guns, the size of gun, the caliber of gun was the same, although the Italian cruisers were faster. But Collins caught them by surprise. And in a long stern chase, he sank one of them, the Collioni. The, uh, the other cruiser escaped, but it was a triumph by any measure, a huge boost to the morale of the fleet. And when Collins and Sydney returned to Alexandria, they got a rousing welcome, cheered up the harbor. Uh, as Collins wrote in his memoirs, the commander in chief, that's Andrew Cunningham, was lying off our berth in his barge, uh, which came alongside as we secured. His, uh, his first words were, well done. I was uh, very relieved when your, uh, your enemy report showed you were on the spot, but how did you get there? This seemed no occasion to go into details of my change of plan, so I replied, Providence guided me, sir. And with a smile, Sir Andrew replied, well, in future, you can continue to take your orders from Providence. Back home in Australia, Collins was, was front page news, hailed as a hero. It was the first truly significant Australian victory of the war. The army had not yet really begun to fight. So it was the first victory of the war at sea or anywhere else. And overnight, he became a household name. He was uh, an interesting man, John Collins, born in Tasmania often formal and aloof, uh, very pucker, a strict disciplinarian, always uh, in immaculate white uniform, even in the, the heat of the fight. He was not loved by his sailors, as heck all it was. I think it's fair to say that. They didn't like him a great deal. But his unquestioned competence had their unstinting respect, and he became, uh, beyond any doubt, the preeminent Australian naval officer of the war. Heck Waller was... Uh, a very different man and a very different officer. He was one year junior to Collins. He graduated from the college a year later and he was promoted to captain in June, uh, 1940. Uh, he was much admired for appearing on his bridge, looking as if he was going fishing or off to a picnic or something. He'd be seen in a pair of battered shorts, bare feet in leather sandals, a, a knitted woolen beanie jammed on his head and uh, a pipe firmly clenched between his teeth. But he was a skilled tactician, uh, a great leader of men. And I've spoken to men who served with him and under him and who knew him. And it is very fair to say that indeed they did love him, as I think few people would, uh, would do. I don't know how many commanding officers of any sort, the Army, Navy or Air Force are loved, but Waller was. They thought he was just great. To what must surely have been his eternal regret, he was ashore that day in September 1940 when his ship steward sank her first submarine under the uh, temporary command of her navigator not far off uh, Alexandria. It was a, a bigger catch than they knew at the time. Uh, the submarine, the Gonda, had been carrying Italian frogmen who'd planned to make a, a human torpedo attack on the, uh, the Mediterranean fleet in Alexandria. Stuart had been out in the med with the fleet, out at sea with the fleet. Uh, she had an engine breakdown, one of many, that dogged them all the time and was sent limping back to Alexandria. The navigator uh, decided, well, he, he'd enter harbour the next morning. So he stooged around off Alexandria by night and just happened to get a submarine contract on the, on the Aztec. So for the rest of the night, back and forward, back and forward, they went with the Aztec, ping, 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 and the, the submarine held down. It went on for, uh, for most of the night and, and into the morning, relentlessly, back and forth, back and forth. In the morning, as uh, the submarine surfaced badly damaged, uh, an RAF Coastal Command Sunderland turned up at the last minute to drop a few bombs and claim the credit, uh, as the Air Force will. But it was emph emphatically an Australian kill, and it helped cement the reputation of the Australians there in the Mediterranean, a reputation that grew as the weeks and months rolled by. Then came the, the Battle of, uh, of Matapan, a great uh, clash with the Italians. It would turn out to be the Royal Navy's last great battleship fleet action. Uh, fought on the day and night of the 28th of March, 1941, in the waters south of Greece and Creek. Matapan is the, uh, the southernmost part of mainland Greece. Andrew Cunningham was at sea with the fleet with, uh, with three battleships, uh, his flagship war spy, 
and the battleships Baron and Valiant and the aircraft carrier HMS Formidable. Uh, he had an, an advantage there, both Valiant and the, the carrier Formidable had radar. Primitive radar, it was, but nonetheless, it was there and it worked to a point. And uh, the Italians did not have it. None of their ships carried radar. They had but one battleship, but it was the brand new uh, Vittoria Veneto. Uh, fast, modern, powerful, very much faster than the British. But they also outnumbered the British in, in cruisers, light and, and heavy cruisers. The battle is too complex to go into here, really, I guess, because we seesawed back and forth. But it was, a, it was a stroke of great good fortune. It, be, it began not, uh, not in the Mediterranean, not in Alexandria, not in Rome, but uh, in Britain at the, uh, the headquarters of the, uh, the cable busting outfit, Bletchley Park, where a, a young woman, just 19 years old, young English woman, uh, cracked the Italian naval code. By sheer good luck, she noticed a discrepancy in something and she ran a mathematical formula at it and worked out uh, that there was something about to happen in X day plus five or something to that effect. And so they threw every resource they had at it. And by the time they'd finished, Andrew Cunningham had uh, a pretty good idea of when and where the Italian Navy would be at sea. He had to be very careful not to let this intelligence uh, out, not to let the Italians know how they'd been discovered. So he invented a couple of subterfuges. First of all, he himself dressed in civilian clothes, took a golf bag and went ashore that night or that afternoon to give the impression that he was not planning to go to sea. The Japanese naval attaché in Alexandria was reporting everything to the Italians. Uh, and he also decided that he would have to invent some way of discovering the British fleet that was not ultra. So they sent up a Sunland aircraft, Coastal Command aircraft, which just happened to find the Italian fleet and report it. So the secret of Ultra was safeguarded. Two Australian ships uh, took part in, in Matapan. The cruiser Perth, which had arrived to replace Sydney. Uh, and again, uh, the fighting Stuart in a tumultuous twisting and turning night engagement with uh, Italian cruisers and destroyers <clears throat> described in Stewart's unofficial log. This uh, log is interesting. It's anonymous. It's uh, just typewritten sheets of, of fool's cap paper. Uh, there's no record now of who compiled it. and It was entirely unofficial. Uh, it sits in the, uh, the Naval Historical Society in Sydney in their collection. Don't know who wrote it, but it says at the beginning of it, this uh, is a record to set the record straight of HMAS Stewart's activities in the Mediterranean. And it's a brilliant historical record. It's beautifully done. This is, a, this is a, an excerpt from it. The snarl and snap, bark, bristle, and rapid yap of a dogfight would be the best, best way to draw a parallel of the next 15 minutes. This was a night fight. Faint splashes in the darkness indicated enemy shells falling unpleasantly close. The flame and roar of our guns a searchlight suddenly switched on to circle a moment and then shut off to leave the night blacker than before. For one awful moment, Stuart was centered in war spite searchlight. Would Stuart be recognized? She was. The pallid light of slowly falling star shell, brief silhouette of an enemy frantically firing streams of colored tracer bullets, phosphorescent wake, the ting ting of the fire gongs, and the shouts of the supply party sweating as they sent up ammunition for the insatiable guns. Andrew Cunningham described the, uh, the sight of the enemy as the most thrilling moment of his entire naval career. The, uh, the approaching Italian fleet was first spotted by an Australian petty officer uh, in Stewart, which was right out in the, in the vanguard of the fleet. Not long afterwards, uh, a young midshipman in Valiant, high up, uh, in, uh, in Valiant, also spotted the, uh, the Italians. Uh, and that was uh, a young bloke named Midshipman Prince Philip Mountbatten of Greece, who was there at the battle uh, and uh, whose searchlight lit up the, uh, the oncoming Italians. In the night battle in the uh, Malay, Stuart fired on two Italian cruisers, 
uh, sank one destroyer and badly damaged a second that had to be sunk later. Stewart thought they'd also engaged uh, some cruisers, but they hadn't. The three uh, Italian cruisers, central to the battle, had all been disabled one by one and, uh, and, uh, and sat there uh, sinking and adrift. Admiral uh, Cunningham referred to uh, Stewart's part in the battle, though, as Stewart's wild night. Ian MacDonald was uh, a young bloke from Perth, WA, a signalman from Stewart, and he wrote in a letter home, the time is, uh, is somewhere around 2 a.m. I've just come down from the bridge. The night is now still. We might be on a Sunday night river trip. An hour ago, uh, it was so different, so terribly, gloriously different. Even now in the distance, we see specks of light, mute witnesses to the fact that men over there are fighting for their lives, fighting flames. For over that last hour or so, we have taken part in one of those glorious spectacles that only occur once or twice in a lifetime and are only viewed by the chosen view. A night action by two fleets at sea. Mattapan was a, an Allied victory and Stuart had played a part in it. The British lost not one ship uh, and only three men killed. The Italians had 2,300 men killed and those three heavy cruisers plus two destroyers sunk. Uh, there are several reasons, as I explained earlier on, Cunningham had ultra intelligence that let him know where his enemy was at sea. But he was a better and bolder tactician than his Italian opponent. With a carrier in his fleet, he had both air reconnaissance and torpedo bombers, and the British had trained in night fighting, uh, which the Italians had not. And as I said, the battleship Valiant and the carrier Formidable had radar primitive though it was, and they occasionally managed to spot the, uh, the oncoming enemy. More critical still, the Italian Navy, the Regia Marina, uh, and the Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, were barely on speaking terms. It seems incredible now when you read about it. But uh, they hated each other. The, the Air Force was far more of a fascist pro Mussolini outfit. The Navy uh, was more professional and, and less political. And uh, they fought on those terms. Uh, an Italian admiral at sea requesting air support from the Air Force had to send his request all the way up a laborious chain to the headquarters in Rome, Defence Department in Rome, Commando Supremo, as it was called. And then it had to go back down again to the Air Force, which meant that time and time and time again, Italian bombers arrived too late. And sometimes not at all. When uh, a few did turn up on the morning after Matapan, they killed some Italian survivors uh, in the water. Matapan was a, a heavy blow to Italian morale. It was Italy's worst ever defeat at sea. Uh, it's become folklore, folk legend, that the Italian Navy wasn't much good. Uh, it was actually. It was a competent Navy, and its, its commanders were were competent and its seamen were, uh, were good people. But it lacked aggression. It lacked that, that fighting spirit, uh, almost to a point of defeatism where the Royal Navy, the British, expected to win their battles. They'd been doing it mostly for 300 years and they went out in the expectation they'd win. The Italian Navy often went out in the expectation that they probably wouldn't, particularly if they were up against the British. And that morale, those made a huge difference to both sides. After uh, more than a year in the Mediterranean, uh, it was an ongoing daily miracle that the uh, Australian destroyers were able to keep the sea and, and perform their uh, allotted duties. Engine breakdowns were becoming more frequent. Uh, a steam pipe would fracture or a, a shaft bearing would run hot and the ship would literally come to a stop a painted ship upon a painted ocean, as the, as the poem goes, uh, a sitting duck while the engineers work to restore things. And there is an argument that the engineers were the true heroes of the scrap iron flotilla in the Mediterranean. They invariably managed to get the thing going, get the show on the road again, although they really got the credit that they so richly deserved. And more remarkable still was the, uh, the maintenance of morale. 
in the engine rooms uh, in the height of summer, the temperature there could reach 60 and more degrees Celsius, 60 and more degrees Celsius. Think of, think of that. Uh, so much so that men could generally only work down there in, in 10 or 15 minute shifts at best, or they would come up to the, uh, to the upper deck desperate for air, where the temperature is probably 35 or 40. They have a bucket of water sloshed over them, and then another 10 minutes later, they go back down again. And they kept this up day and day, and night and night. They lived uh, with moments, sometimes days of naked fear beneath constant air attack. And home was a long way away, linked only by uncertain mail. I asked a friend of mine a while ago, the current naval officer and admiral, in fact, what was the biggest change he'd seen in the Navy during his, his term? And he said, the internet. I thought he was going to say some sort of you know, fabulous missile or you know, destroyers or whatever. And he said, it has been both a blessing and a curse. It keeps uh, families in touch, sailors in touch with their families. But it also gives them the bad news quicker. So it's, got, it's a double-edged sword. But there was nothing like this. These men were away, some of them, for two and more years. And they got the occasional letter. Letters to, uh, to ships at sea were generally unreliable. The Postal Service improved during the war as, as they got more practice at it, but it was never totally reliable. And many of most, uh, many if not most of the junior sailors were teenagers. Uh, Vendetta's captain, Rodney Rhodes, a lieutenant uh, when he got the job in 1940, was only 30 years old. Uh, the youngest man ever to command a Royal Australian Navy destroyer. And I don't think that's a record that's going to be broken. Uh, Heck Waller himself, uh, the shopkeeper's son from Benalla, was uh, only as old as the century, 40 or 41. Yet they were tough, they were stoic, they were committed to a job, a fight they believed was worthwhile, essential. And time and again, this appears uh, in their letters home or the memoirs they wrote later. And it's impressive. They knew they were fighting a just and proper war that Nazism and Italian fascism, and of course, later Japanese militarism, they knew that they had to be defeated for the peace of the world. They knew they were not out there like their enemy, like the Germans or the Italians or the Japanese. They knew they were not there for the purpose of conquest. They were simply to defeat evil and then to get back home as fast as they could. And they were proud of it. Our, our wars since have not had that that certainty to them, have they? Whether it's Vietnam or Afghanistan. This uh, perhaps was the last of the just wars where the men who fought it knew they were fighting a great crusade and fought it to the end. Discipline held, believe it or not. There were the, the usual minor offences, of course, and it did return uh, drunk from leave, etc. And there was one mini mutiny in Voyager alongside an Alexandria described by her gunner's mate, Petty Officer Arthur Cooper. Pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> Nicole, sorry about that. Cooper wrote, um, we are ready to start work. We could not get out of the forehead mess. Half a dozen or so of the older blokes had sat themselves outside the mess and would not let us out on deck. Uh, the first lieutenant, Alan Strangler Lewis, he was known as Strang because he was a, a boxer. Came down, but he could not get them to move. It seems they are not going to start work or take the ship to sea unless something was done about the lack of anti-aircraft guns. The guns had no elevation. They were useless against planes. Voyager's captain, uh, Lieutenant Commander John Walsh, resolved it with tact and discretion. No one was charged and life went on. At Christmas 1940, things changed again. The Luftwaffe was ordered to send in its crack anti-shipping unit, Flieger Corps 10, to Sicily, and that brought squadrons of, uh, of Junkers 88 heavy bombers and the much-feared Stuka dive bomber into the act. On January the, uh, the 22nd, the Australian Army's 6th Division, surging eastwards, captured and held the port of Tobruk, and on the 11th of February, General Erwin Rommel arrived at Tripoli to command what would become the Africa Corps. The Australian destroyers would soon be ordered into the perilous, arduous task of supplying the, the garrison of Tobruk with food and fuel, ammunition and men, and what they came to call the Tobruk Ferry, or sometimes the Spud Run, they called it. 
And then came the disasters of Greece and Crete, two of the great strategic allied blunders of the war, for which the blame may be laid squarely on the shoulders of, uh, of Winston Churchill. Uh, whether or, or not it was politically or diplomatically important, the decision in March 41 to divert the Australian and New Zealand divisions from a successful winning campaign in North Africa to oppose the Germans in Greece was an act of the uh, utmost military folly. Catastrophe might be a better word. And for the Navy, their darkest fears were realized. The evacuation had to be done. Tens of thousands of troops had to be drawn from Greece and then from Crete, and it could only be done by sea. The cost in ships and men was horrendous, so heavy that it almost broke the Mediterranean fleet. The cruise of Perth on her way from Crete to Alexandria was, uh, was bombed, and uh, four sailors and nine of her soldier passengers uh, were killed. Miraculously, the scrap iron destroyers survived the incessant bombing uh, unscathed. With the disasters of Greece and Crete come and gone, and with Rommel and the Africa Corps now rampant in Libya, the Tobruk Ferry, the Spud Run, became ever more critical. All the scrap iron ships took part, uh, and they endured sheer hell because the Germans knew they were coming. The course from Alexandria to Tobruk, 560 k's, ran in more or less a straight line due west along the Libyan coast. The second half it well within the range of the German squadrons that had been transferred to North Africa. And as I said, the Germans knew they were coming. At first, the ships sailed singly, Voyager and then Waterhen made the first trips. But uh, later on, they, they went in pairs so that if one ship was hit, the other, the other could rescue. They would load in, uh, in Alexandria and uh, be out the gate before 0800 slipping west into the Mediterranean at 25 knots or so. And the first couple of hours would be relatively quiet until, until the Stukas found them uh, in the afternoon before they would arrive in Tobruk. And they came to call the last run of the leg Bomb Alley. It was ever a relief to get through it shaken but unscathed for the entrance to Tobruk itself just before midnight. Then there was no rest, of course. They would be loading uh, and unloading. There'd be bags of mail from the garrison to go home and always the wounded to be loaded on with uh, infinite care. There might be 200 of soldiers or more, uh, filthy, dirty and torn or bloody uniforms, many of them wounded uh, and just stuck wherever they could fit on deck. The stretcher cases would be taken down to the mess decks, but everyone else would be parked where they could. And then we'd back down Bob Alley, Bomb Alley again and back to, uh, to Alexandria or Mercer Matru, another port there. Eventually, the enemy got water in the old chook, as the sailors called her, on the evening of the 29th of June, 1941, off the North African coast. She was attacked by a flight of Italian Stugas, and she wasn't hit, but there were near misses, and, uh, and they badly damaged her. Eventually, she, they had to get rid of her. She had to be uh, let go. A British destroyer, HMS Defender, took her in tow and took her crew off, but the next morning, she rolled over and sank. But only one of her crew was injured. One bloke had been hit by a can of flying peaches, which had come unstuck in the galley. That was about it. Sad and more melancholy, I think, was the death of the little sloop Parramatta, who was not part of the, uh, the scrap iron flotilla. And she was sunk by a U-boat, U-559, uh, in November, uh, on November uh, the 28th, 1941. Uh, a tragic loss, uh, a tragic loss for her captain, Commander Jefferson Walker, had been marked for higher things, it was a brilliant young officer. The outstanding personality uh, in all this was Heck Waller, a truly great leader. He stayed there till the end, till the flotilla was withdrawn from the Mediterranean towards the end of 1941. As I've said, from a humble background, he was the son of a shopkeeper in Benalla. Uh, he rose by talent, energy, and sheer hard work to become, I think, Australia's greatest fighting sailor. Uh, John Collins could compete for that title. He fought through the Pacific War too, was badly injured and survived to become a Vice Admiral, a Knight of the Realm and, uh, and Chief of the Naval Staff. But uh, my money is on Waller and I would have paid a fortune at King's Ransom to admit him. As uh, Andrew Cunningham wrote of him in his memoirs, Hector MacDonald Laws Waller will always remain in my mind as one of the very finest types of Australian Naval officer. Full of good cheer, with a great sense of humour, 
undefeated and always burning to get at the enemy. He kept the old ships in his flotilla, steward, vampire, vendetta, voyager, waterhen, hard at it always, greatly loved and admired by everyone. His loss in HMAS Perth in the Java Sea in March 1942 was a heavy deprivation for the young Navy of Australia. And every word of that was true. The ships uh, met their various ends. Waterhen was lost in the Med, as we know. Uh, Vampire was sunk by the Japanese in the Indian Ocean. Voyager ran aground in Timor, delivering some, uh, some commandos there towards the end of the war. And bits of her bones can still be seen there on the coast, the south coast. Uh, Vendetta was a virtual wreck and had to be towed back to Australia across the uh, Indian Ocean. And Stuart saw out the war in rather reduced circumstances as a, as a, a transport ship carrying cargo up to, up to New Guinea. She was finally put to rest in the Parramatta River where she lay on the mud until she was, uh, until she was broken up for scrap. But there will always be, I think, an HMAS Stuart in the Royal Australian Navy. Well, I'd like to close with some lines. This is a bit off the wall, I guess. But close with some lines from the poet Homer, Homer's Odyssey, who wrote of gods and heroes in the Mediterranean. Because for an Australian Odyssey, and this was an Australian Odyssey, it was magnificent, indeligible for its courage, seamanship and endurance. And here's what Homer wrote. Yea, and if some god shall wreck me in the wine dark deep, even so I will endure. For already have I suffered full much, and much have I toiled in peril of waves and war. Let this be added to the tale of those. There is no finer story in our naval history than the story of the Scrap Iron Fertiller. Thank you for listening. It's been an honour and a pleasure to be with you. I've left a bit of time for questions. If anyone wants to, uh, to fire up, uh, away you go. Thank you very much, Mike. That was tremendous. Thank you. I can see some clapping. <laughs> you can hear my clap. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, there's, there's a, a few comments. There's a couple of questions uh, and, and comments. Yeah. Um, and then we can go to ra a raising of hands if anyone wants to uh, ask additional questions. Um, question from uh, Greg Pierce. Do you think Les Clifford could have been one of the authors of the Chronicle of the HMAS Stewart? Uh, Les, uh, for those who don't know the name, wrote a, a terrific book about his time in Stuart in the Mediterranean. He was a signalman. They tended to be among the more literate sailors. They could write well. Had to. Uh, I don't think Les wrote this. I think that the, the Chronicle of Stuart, I'm pretty sure, was written by several officers. Waller might have contributed himself, but I'm pretty sure it was written by officers because it had an officer's uh, point of view to it. Uh, but it's brilliant stuff. Okay, good. Michael Buttridge says, thank you, Mike, for this uh, very engaging presentation. It reflects the book, which I found fascinating. So, Oh, we've had a reader. Oh. Yes. He's, he's, well, he's written the um, review that will go onto our oh, website. Right. Uh, yes, for which, thank you. <clears throat> um, which I found fascinating. There was a very fine balance be between high-level strategic situation, the operational activities of the five ships and the other Australian ships in the fleet, and the personal memoirs and reflections of so many participants at every level. While aiding your understanding of the, the battle, it was also enriching our feeling of for those involved. So that's tremendous. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, Andrew Boatman says, thanks, Mike. Wonderful descriptions of AMS, a HMAS Sydney and the Scrap Island Flotilla in action. Did the ship's company get much shore leave in Alexandra or elsewhere? Yeah, uh, they did. Other tales of exploits ashore, stories of interactions, friends, otherwise... Yeah, they did get ashore, and uh, principally Alexandria, but also the other ports as well, because uh, the Mediterranean was very much a, a, a naval sea. Uh, there was the British had a fleet club in Alexandria, uh, which was for sailors only, and then eventually the, an Australian club was set up there as well for Australian sailors. And miracle of miracles, it actually produced cold Australian beer, which was very much uh, like there were there were movie theaters. Uh, there was in Alexandria, there was Sister Street, which was basically bars and whorehouses, which were, which were well patronised. Uh, Australians had some experience of Egypt in the, the First World War and both the Second World War. They found sex easy to acquire. Uh, they could play tennis. They could go swimming in Alexandria. They got time off. But bear in mind, Alexandria was also regularly bombed as well. 
Uh, in Malta, they, they enjoyed Malta too. That was very much a sailor's town because it had been the headquarters of the British fleet. They were treated hospitably by the, the Maltese, people who were, were fabulous to them. Uh, Maltese families took them into their homes for that first Christmas, 1939, and so on. So, yes, they, they did get downtime, and a lot of them used to explore further field in Egypt. They would go into, into Cairo, check out the pyramids, that sort of thing. They did get time off, but never really was it time off. It was all, you were always on it. Okay. Pete Edwards says, congratulations on your fourth great piece of naval history. Could you comment on what the RAN has done to support research and writing on its history because of you as an independent historian have done so much? Um, the RAN is, is, is good on its history, actually. They, they cherish it and they look after it. There's a, an outfit called the Sea Power Centre, which sort of has two functions. One, it's a, it's a strategic think tank with the, all sorts of clever people thinking about what they do with the Chinese and so on. But it's also uh, the, the Navy's history section. And they have vast files down there, photographs and documents and, and uh, the whole thing. Uh, it's easily accessible. They're incredibly helpful. Uh, they're terrific people. So the Navy, the Navy does look after its history. What, what, I, what I try to do with this book is not just do a, a, a dull recitation of it and then they set sail and then they fired the guns and they went home again. Uh, I want it to be about the people because a ship is nothing without its people. It's just a lump of floating iron, a weapons platform. It is the people that make it. And it's the ordinary sailor who is just as important to the telling of the story as, uh, as the most you know, gold-braided admiral. Great, thanks. Um, has anyone got any further questions of Mike? Jim, uh, can you put your microphone on? Okay, that right? Got can it. you hear me? No, you're right, Jan, so you, you go next. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Good. I'm yeah. sorry, I was in the process of typing it out. Um, two of the yachtsman scheme men, volunteers, became captains in the, of, the, of the scrap iron flotilla ships at the end of the war in the Pacific. Yeah. One was uh, Lieutenant Max Germain, who was appointed as captain of Vendetta yeah. and went through the islands, etc. Yeah. You know, returning, collecting prisoners. He was at the surrender of the Japanese at Rabaul. Uh, and the other was um, Ellison Hawker, who was the last captain in Stuart. And he's a Tasmanian, uh, he lived to, in, well in his 90s. He died a few years ago. You're better informed uh, than I am. I didn't know that. <laughs> well done. And uh, he, um, yes, it, it, it's quite fascinating. He used to come over for the uh, Scrap Iron Flotilla uh, get-togethers once a year. Yeah. So I just thought, you know, it's it's interesting though that they were really they were thought well enough of the you know the Royal Navy. They were both appointed to commands when they came back. Yeah, I'm not so, that yachtsman scheme is another great story, which has never been fully told, has it? No. Well, I'm about to publish it. Oh, well, go for it. Go your heart. So oh, I've no. just been speaking to the publisher today, and hopefully by the end of October it will be out. Terrific. Well done. So thank you. It's okay. taken me a long time. Yeah, I bet you the research yeah. would have been hard. But that's a great story. Good luck. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks, Jan. Now, Jim, you had something to ask. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes I can. Right. Uh, I just wanted to uh, congratulate Mike on uh, the contribution he's made. Thank and you. Should, given that she's just been on, I should include uh, Jan Robert Spillett in, in that mm. congratulation. I had a forty-one year career in the. RAN post World War II, starting in January 1950 at uh, FND, uh, Flinders Naval Depot, as it then was. But Mike's uh, remark about what, the Navy being good about history um, brought back to mind that when we were there at the Naval College, from 50 to 53, I learned more about the Napoleonic Wars, <laughs> and the Battle of Trafalgar, and the Battle of Abakir Bay, and various yeah, other. At Nelson. And, and I heard nothing, nothing about the history and the exploits and achievements of the RAN ships um, in, 
during World War I or World War II. There was, at that time, there was still a sense of shame, I think, hanging over us, over the loss of the uh, Canberra and the Sydney, and there was a reluctance to open up. But thanks, I'm surprised at that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But thanks to you and thanks to various others, including Jan, the history has been now very well uh, put together and we have got a, a pretty good record of uh, the achievements of the RAN. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. It was uh, Thank you. Badly, Thank you, Jim. badly missing in the earlier days. Thank you. Yeah, well, but it was very still in the 50s, I guess. It was still very RN oriented. We still brought British ships and um, they celebrated Trafalgar night uh, in, in the wardroom and all that sort of thing. That's a lot of that's changed now. The, the big two big naval dinners they have currently are the scrap iron flotilla dinner and the uh, the sinking of, uh, of the Emden, the first world war, the first victory. Yeah. So it's much more of an Australian Navy now, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Hey, Jim. Um, yeah. There's another question here from Tony Hastings. Uh, you mentioned the lack of anti aircraft gun. Were they, were they ever improved? Uh, yeah, they were. The, um, the Italians had a gun they called the Breda, I think it's pronounced, B-R-E-D-A. And it was basically an army gun. It was an anti-tank weapon to start with. Um, and uh, but it, had, it was perfectly capable of very high elevation. So it was absolutely entirely useful as an anti-aircraft gun as well. And uh, they captured thousands of them in the, uh, in the, uh, the North African desert. Uh, when the, the Italian army was routed there before the Africa Corps turned up. There's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a great story. I can't, not, not a naval story, I've got to tell you. Uh, when the Italians were sort of tumbling all over themselves in retreat and the British were taking prisoners left, right and centre, a young British army captain who had a, was a, under, he had a company or something under his command, nothing more, was asked by his superiors uh, back in headquarters, he said, they said, how many Italian prisoners have you got? And he said, oh, about five acres. We <laughs> 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 sort of explains it all. But they captured a lot of these guns. And eventually the Navy managed by hook or by crook to get hold of them, totally um, you know, unofficially. And they <laughs> bolted them all over every, um, every uh, horizontal surface they could find on the ships. And they were a much more effective gun. But still, they, they were no real match for... Uh, for uh, a determined attack by Stuka dive bombers, but much more effective. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I forgot, Mike, before to say very much congratulations, but oh. I wanted to mention you because of Heck Waller. Yeah. Um, there was a um, apparently obituaries written for he a general one for Heck Waller and two other Australian commanders who were killed during World War Two by, I think it was Admiral Colville, Jim Dixon, am I correct? Uh, and it was called, he described the Australians as something peculiar to themselves, that they have really embodied what the British, you know, the Royal Navy admired, but they had a different sort of attitude slightly. Um, and it's taken, it was used as the uh, title for a paper by a guy called Jason Sears, met quite, I reckon it's 20 years ago at least, when he wrote, as part of a, I think his PhD or something. And I have a feeling I saw him promoted recently in a list uh, to Commodore. Oh, no, no, no. So, Col no. Col but Col it, it's interesting that the British, this is written at the time, you know, or just after Heck Waller's uh, death, and yeah. a couple of the others that he, Australian commanders, that he, he recognised or he, he felt that they were really a bit different. Yeah, they, they, very, they were. They were. They were very competent. They, 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 part of it was the recruiting. Now, when when the the Navy first set up in the Royal Australian Naval College in uh, where was it Geelong? Um, yes, was Geelong. The uh, the recruiting process was a bit different. You could join the, you could join the Royal Naval College Britannia in Britain if you were the son of an earl or the son of a bishop or the son of an admiral or you had a hyphen in your name you got in and you had to pay for your tuition as if you were going to Eton or, or Wellington, you know. Mm. So they got, they got the upper class and they was, no doubt they're officers and gentlemen. But the, and the Australians, 
democratic, newly formed Federation of Australia refused to do that. You would get in by merit alone. There was a, uh, a quota system for the states. I think each state got to choose two New South Wales, two Victoria, two Queensland, and so on. But you got in on, on merit. Uh, a shopkeeper's son, like Heck Waller, would never have made it as an officer in the Royal Navy in those days. Simply just would not have happened, lower class. Uh, so we got the cream. We got the, the very best. Uh, and when it came to the crunch, uh, it showed. Yes. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I think we'll we'll wind up now, Mike. Thank you. That was a tremendous a presentation. Oh, it's a pleasure. It was nice to be asked. I, 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 I had a great time when I was down there the, well, a few months ago now it was, but my back went on me and I was I was virtually crippled and to be sort of put on the plane horizontally to go home. So I missed the rest of the conference last time, but this has been a terrific time. Again. And well, that's, that's a segue into um, a discussion about our next conference um, coming up in yeah. the beachheads, but it's not, it's not Navy this time, but well, it wasn't, it had Navy components and well, it could have, I don't know. Uh, Sorry about that, Marcus. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's tremendous. Congratulations. Thank you, Bruce. So, everyone, in the next couple of days, we'll be sending out another three-minute feedback survey. And I, I, I might leave it here if I can. Yes, thank you, Mike. thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Tremendous. Yes. Okay. Um, and thanks for you, everyone who filled out the last one. I hope you do it again. We, we take notice. Um, our next speaker will be the distinguished, distinguished Australian historian David Horner discussing his new book, The War Game, Australia War Leadership from Gallipoli to Iraq, and that'll be by Zoom on Wednesday, 19th of October. Tickets on sale now. Tickets are on sale now, yes, and there's information on the site, or will be very soon. It is. Um, like to remind you about our one, next one, next conference, the Bloody Beachheads, the battles of Gona, Buna, and San Ananda. Uh, and that was postponed because of COVID, as you some of you might remember. It's been pushed out to Saturday, the 12th of November, to coincide with the 80th anniversary. And it's now going to be at the East Melbourne RSL in Stanley, Stanley Groves Drive in Malvern. And uh, look forward to registration and information on our site. So this brings the evening sessions to a close. Thanks again to Mike, who's left us, but thanks again. Thanks also to Jason, who keeps us going behind the scenes, and thank you all for joining us. It's a good, been a good crowd. We hope you come again, and good night from the committee and myself. <laughs>